Welcome to the magnificent Chateau de Chambord in the Loire Valley, which is an enormous and glorious but somehow sad castle. It is the largest in the Loire. It should be number one on your visit list if you are visiting the area, but I found it kind of historically sad and I will explain to you why. You can get tickets for the Chateau on their website. Also make a note if you are visiting during the summer season, um, throughout the summer there are concerts and orchestral things that you can get tickets for but also between April and November there is a horses and birds of prey or renaissance sort of falconry and horsemanship show which I would have loved to see and we did not time it so that we could visit that but well worth a visit it's a 45 minute show it's at 11 45 a.m and 4 p.m currently in 2023 we got our tickets at the tourist office in Amboise but you can also get them online I will include links there is paid parking at the chateau. You have a short walk to reach the building. The chateau was built by Francois Premier between 1519 and his death in 1547. And there is some speculation that none other than Leonardo da Vinci may have had a hand in some of the architecture, including the completely asymmetrical roofline that you see here, which is rumored to have been modeled possibly on the skyline of the city of Constantinople. He may have also designed the incredible centerpiece double helix staircase of this chateau that is a highlight of the chateau. It is two separate three-story stairways where large groups of people can go up and come down simultaneously without ever meeting each other. The chateau has 440 rooms and 282 fireplaces. You can see all the chimneys. It looks like no two are the same. There are 84 staircases here. And at the height of construction in 1526, there were 1,800 workers working on this masterpiece of Renaissance architecture. Francois built it as a weekend hunting lodge, if you can imagine this being your weekend getaway. But he spent really only seven weeks here total throughout his reign, possibly because he had royal residences nearby at Amboise and Blois. And Chambord, for all its magnificence, had some drawbacks. It had no town nearby to supply provisions and it was left completely unfurnished between visits. So Francois and his entourage of sometimes up to 2,000 people would have had to bring in all of their own provisions with them, including all of their furnishings. So they would hunt a lot and provide food that way, but they had to bring their furnishings along with them. When we visited in May of 2022, the chateau was under quite a good deal of renovation and reconstruction, as you can see by all the scaffolding here, but it was still awe-inspiring to see this and I am looking forward to showing you all of this gorgeous architecture. The size of the rooms and the large spaces of this castle also made it very hard to heat so it was really just limited to a hunting lodge and for weekend hunting parties especially in spring and fall when the game would have been easy to see throughout the park when the deciduous trees had no leaves and the visibility would be more more clear throughout the forest. The tallest spire on the roofline also held a lighted torch whenever the king was in residence. But sadly, in almost 500 years of existence, you could probably count on not too many fingers how many times that torch was lit. Here is that beautiful staircase. And you come into some of these spaces where you can see how Francois had his initial F and his salamander emblem carved on so many chateaus, but especially on this one, you can see his alternating F and the salamander everywhere on this ceiling. And I'm always curious, why a salamander? Kings throughout the ages have chosen lions and leopards and falcons to represent them as an emblem, but a salamander, I'm not sure why you would want to be represented by a lizard. I feel like they should leave us a reason why they pick their emblems, maybe. All right, moving on. After the death of Francois in 1547, this gorgeous chateau sat empty for almost 100 years until Louis XIII gave it to his brother, who did some restoration. And more restoration was done by Louis XIV, who actually also furnished the royal apartments and added a stable for 1,200 horses. But he is said to have only visited it six times in his very long reign. What a sad place to sit empty for so long. He had abandoned it altogether by 1685. The next, or possibly actually the only resident who ever actually lived here as a resident, was the father-in-law of Louis XV, the deposed and exiled King Stanislaw of Poland, who lived here between 1725 and 1733. And after 1750, it sat empty again until 1792, when the revolutionary government of France ordered the sale of the furnishings and even the wood paneling and wood flooring 
were sold for the value of the timber, and it was said that the interior wooden doors were also burned to heat the giant rooms, which seems like such a loss. It was next handed down from Napoleon Bonaparte to a subordinate, and from there it passed into the hands of the Duke of Bordeaux, one Henri Charles, who took the title of the Comte de Chambord, and you can see his throne and some of his insignia embroidered on a lot of the gear here. Apparently, he also dreamed of being crowned at King Henry V, and it was said that he actually had his coronation robes and regalia ready to go. But he, unfortunately, did not live in the chateau, even though he opened it to the public and visited it only once in 1871. By 1830, it had sat empty for so long that Henry Wadsworth Longfellow visited and wrote that it sat mournful and deserted, sadly dilapidated, with grass overgrowing the pavement and the courtyard. So even though he visited once, maybe that torch was lit one more time for the Comte de Chambord, who never did become the king. It next saw some use as a hospital during the Franco-Prussian War in 1870-71, and by World War I, it was owned by the Dukes of Parma, who lived in Austria. So in 1915, it was confiscated as enemy property by the government of France and taken back into the French portfolio of properties. During World War II, it was thought to be a safe enough distance from Paris that the collections of art from the Louvre and the Chateau at Compiègne were actually stored here, so Mona Lisa and Venus de Milo made this their home briefly, although they came closer than you would like to being damaged when an American B-52 Liberator bomber crashed into the lawn in 1944. Restoration to its current beauty did not begin really until after World War II. It is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It was really amazing to walk through this beautiful and historic chateau, but it was hard to feel that it's sort of been sadly unused and neglected and sort of unloved over its nearly 500 years of existence. It seems a sad thing to be sitting empty for so long. I hope this inspires you, though, to come and visit this incredible but somehow uncherished chateau, even just to imagine the hunting parties that would have taken place here over the centuries. I will be continuing the rest of our Loire Valley trip in the playlist pictured here. As always, thanks for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.